The second way of valuing a, uh, a swap is in terms of forward rate agreements. Um, I don't really like this one. This one uh, is, a, is a lot of extra work, but you know you should know how to do it. Once you have a spreadsheet programmed or an algorithm uh, programmed that, that uh, all you have to do is just input the variables, it doesn't matter which way you go. Uh, so you should be aware of how to do it both ways. But in this case, uh, again, I have my timeline. It's the same timeline I had before, three months, nine months, 15 months, and I have my zero rates, and I have my discount factors all in place. And what we want to do is figure out um, at each point in time, what is the net cash flow that needs to be uh, traded and figure out what the forward rate is for that period of time that we're going to discount it by. So our times are, again, our next, next payment will be uh, three months from now, 0.25, six months after that, 0.75, and 1.25 after that. We need to know what our fixed payments are, and we already know them, 4, 4, and 4. That's easy enough. Then we need to know what our floating payments are. This is the fixed payments we'll receive in, but how much is going out at that point in time? Well, to do that, we're going to need some forward rates here. So we're going to need this one, and we're going to need this one. And we've already seen how we can calculate that. We'll just rewrite the formula. The forward rate is... Uh, R2 T2 minus R1 T1 over the, the time span T2 minus T1 for each of these. So all we have to do to figure out the rate in this case is just plug in what we know. So R2 uh, in this case, this is, this is the R2 T2, this is the R1 T1. So we have 0 0.105 times 0 0.75 minus... 0.1 uh, times 0.25 over 0.75 minus 0.25 gives us 0 0.07875 minus 0 0.025 over 0.5, which will give us 0 0.1075. So there we go. So let's do it for the next one. And on this one, here's R2 T2. Here's R1 T1, and we just 0.11 times 1.25 minus 0 0.105.75 over 1.25 minus 0 0.75. 0 0.1375 minus 0 0.07875, which we already calculated over here. So yeah, we're we're doing it right over 0.5 will give us 0.1175. So there we go. But we have a bit of a problem here. This is why I think this is sort of the long way around. We got a bit of a problem with these two rates. And these two rates are continuous compounding. We need to get them into the proper periodicity, Rm. And to do that, you'll recall Rm was equal to m e to the power Rc over m minus 1. So we just have to solve it, uh, the point 0.1075, turn it from a continuous compounding to a periodicity of 2. So the first one would turn to R2 will equal 2 times e to the point 0.1075 over 2 minus 1 and we'll get 0 0.1104. Beautiful. The next one, R2, that applies to the second period of time, will equal 2 times e to the, uh, we have 0 0.1175 over 2 minus 1. That'll give us 0 0.12102. You have to remember to do this step. You have to remember to turn it to, 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 to fix the compounding period. So now, we are in a position to calculate the floating rate payments. And the notional principle is 100 million times our first payment is 0 0.102, 0 0.102 uh, over 2. 100 million times 0 0.102 over 2 gives us negative 5.1. The next one we get to is 100 million times we have 0.1104 over 2, 
will give us negative 5.52. And the last one, 100 million times, we have this rate over here, 0.12, uh, what is it, 12102 over 2 equals negative 6.051. So here we are, we're going to receive these payments and we're going to pay these. So we can net them out because we're not discounting the whole thing. If we net them out, we'll have negative 1.1. Here we'll have negative 1.52. Here we'll have negative 2.051. Now we need our discount factor and we already have our discount factors here. We've already calculated them here. So our discount factor, and it looks like degrees of freedom that I'm writing here, right? Now let's not confuse that with uh, degrees of freedom. That's our discount factor, 0 0.9753, 0 0.9754, 0 0.8715. And we just multiply the net by the discount factor, and that will give us 1.07283. This will give us 1.40678. And here we'll get 1.7874. Add them together, negative uh, 4.267. I'm sorry, I forgot all the negative signs in front of these because we're multiplying a negative number with a positive. We'll get a negative number. Negative 4.267. That is what we received before. So understand on this one, all it is is just you're calculating the forward rate between each of these periods. You'll remember uh, when we uh, uh, get these rates up here, what are these rates? These are zero rates from this period of time to this expiration date. The next one is from zero all the way out. The next one is from zero all the way out. So we need to find, well, since the 10.5 represents this full time period, we only want this time period, which is why we need the forward rate here. Then we need a forward rate here, and it would be so on and so on as we go. This is a nice, easy way to do it uh, in this sense, but we'll end up with uh, um, um, a rate that is not quite useful until we convert it into um, something that is more useful for us. This one already is in the form that we need it to be in. So, there we go. So you'll recall that when a swap is originally set up, um, we're making a point that the value of the swap is pretty much zero. When we say pretty much zero, again, it's not always exactly zero, uh, but it's pretty much zero. It's set up so that it'll be worth basically zero, as close to zero as you can get. Here I have two yield curves. Uh, yield curves. I have an upward sloping yield curve and a downward sloping yield curve. And so this will represent the path that the floating rate will take. So we can say that this is our FL on both cases. And if we conceive of a fixed rate as being somewhere somewhat higher than the short-term rates but somewhat lower than the long-term rates, we can write fix on both of these. This is just a visual, a visual aid. Don't take this to be exactly how it happens. It's just to help you think about this. So let's say that we're short a fixed rate uh, in the swap, we're short on the fixed side and long the floating. Uh, how would that look on day zero? Again, our valuation is very close to zero. But as far as the the uh, payments going into the future, uh, how would that look? Some will be in our favor, some will be against us, right? Well, an easy way to do it is just to read, of course, what we have. We're short fixed, so here we are. We have to pay the fixed, and we receive the floating. Well, if we're paying out at this level and we're receiving at this level clearly we're losing right so our first few payments will tend to look like this on it on an upward sloping yield curve and then at the farther end as we head further out the net present value of those payments will be positive and of course the sum of these negatives and the sum of the positives will get as very close to zero as possible so that when we enter into a swap with an upward sloping yield curve and we're short the fixed and long the floating, we would expect that when we get to the first payment, we'll be paying out. Because remember now, this first payment is known with certainty the moment we enter the swap, we would see that we would be paying out immediately. So once we enter into the swap, uh, we're told, okay, in six months you got to write a check for this much money. 
what? What do you mean? Well, it just not, it's just the way that, that the, the payments would work out that the first one you're going to get to is negative if you have this position with this type of yield curve. If, on the other hand, the yield curve is downward sloping, have a look here. You're short the fixed, which means you're going to pay this, but you're going to receive this. Well, obviously, that's a surplus. So your first payment would actually be the mirror image of this would look like this. Or if you are uh, um, net present valuing uh, or valuing these bonds, the payment stream would tend to look like that. And of course, all of this would be as, when you sum up all the gains and all the losses, it'd be as close to zero as possible. So depending on the shape of the yield curve, uh, your first payment when you enter into the swap may be negative or may be positive. You, that will be known with certainty. Uh, but you have to know that, well, as we move forward, uh, the, the uh, present value of all of those have changed so that it is equal or as close to zero as possible. Well, this is the same scenario except, uh, or not the same scenario, we're going to do the same thing except this time we are short the floating. Instead of being short the fixed, we're short the floating. We're long the fixed, so let's indicate this. Let's uh, say that our fixed rate will look something like this on both sides. So under our first scenario, if we are short floating, which means we pay this, we're long fixed, we'll receive here, obviously, the valuation of the swap will show us being, once we enter the swap, our first payment will be receiving. And then of course, from there on, it will start to decrease until they're equal. And then we start to pay out. Our, our the, the cash flows will turn negative on us. The sum of all that will be very close to this. Well, we'll, we'll equal whatever the value is on day zero, which is again, close to zero. Short floating, which means we're paying here long fixed paying here that means uh, uh, if we're paying out at this amount and receiving at this amount we obviously have a deficit so on an upward sloping yield curve under this scenario our first payment will be positive on a downward sloping yield curve under a scenario in which we're short the floating and long the fixed our first payment will be negative but if we add up all the negative payments and all the positive payments, they will be very, very close to the value of a swap on day zero, which is as close to zero as you'll get.